Good morning. Good morning. I was an enlisted man, so you don't have to call me sir, okay? Whoever said that. So, I brought props. I'm extraordinarily pleased um, that we're doing this again this year. This is our second, and I hope we do this forever. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and uh, I am extremely pleased with what happened last year. The Expo was a huge success as far as I'm concerned. It exposed a lot of our own staff to the capabilities um, that are brought to the work of the archives, as well as sharing our expertise with our friends uh, in the neighborhood. As those of you who um, work with me, I hope understand by now, after three years, I am a huge fan of preservation and conservation. So my very first library job at MIT, before most of you were born, introduced me to the latest in preservation practice at that time. I was hired as a shelver um, and then became a junior library assistant in the humanities library at MIT, which had responsibility for rare books. There was no preservation librarian or program, but the humanities librarian was a dabbler, and I got to do things that you would never do today um, in the name of preservation, like oiling leather bindings. Um, George Kuna, um, or Captain Kuna as we knew him then, who started the Northeast Conservation, Document Conservation Center, consulted for us. And um, the highlight I can remember of one of his visits for me that still sticks out was um, teaching us how to do deacidification of newsprint using Alka-Seltzer tablets. Huge bucket of water, Alka-Seltzer, dip the newspaper, I can still remember that. And for those of you who remember Nicholson Baker and his attack on librarians for all the sins of preservation, I'm the guy who um, he turned over his American newspaper collection to at Duke University. So I have a passion for the topic, and I'm honored to be here working with some of the best in the profession. We have a long history here of um, attention to preservation and caring for our records, starting at the very beginning with the guy who actually created the National Archives, Franklin Roosevelt. This is, for those of you who have never seen one, this is the box that Franklin Roosevelt himself designed to hold his papers. Does it look familiar? So our mission is to preserve and make available, as you know, the records of the government. And fulfilling the first part of that mission can be as simple as unfolding and reboxing documents, or as complex as filling a tear in the Declaration of Independence. Whether we're storing the thousands of color slides from the 1970s Documerica project, which I hope you get to see while you're here, or archiving our own family albums, the basic preservation do's and don'ts apply. Today, we have an extraordinary opportunity to learn more about what our experts do to care for, the, for our nation's records and to find out how to care for our own family treasures. Preservation is a shared responsibility throughout the National Archives, and today's event involved planning and expertise from a range of areas, including preservation programs, information services, agency services, and business support. And I'm grateful to the Archives staff members participating today in a variety of ways, whether by, whether by presenting lectures, staffing the information tables, or providing consultation I'd also like to thank the Preservation Expo Planning Committee, Allison Olson, Amy Lubick, Ann Witte, Audrey Amidon, Hilary Kappen, Jane Long, Jennifer Herman, Jessica Kelmer, and Mary Lynn Ritzenthaler. Their dedication and hard work made this expo possible, and we have, um, at latest count, about 12 billion pieces of paper in our collection, somewhere near 40 million photographs, miles and miles of film and video, and every one of those is a preservation opportunity for us. So welcome to the National Archives.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Mayer. I'm the executive for Research Services, and I have the pleasure of working with Doris Hamburg and the preservation crew in our operations. My message is fairly simple today. Would the uh, staff members of the National Archives in the theater please raise their hands? Okay, thank you. This is for you to understand your work is very much appreciated. The Chief Operating Officer of the Archives contacted me this morning. He sends his regrets he can't be here today. But in this very challenging environment of shifting priorities, I want to underscore the fact that preservation enables access. So the work you're doing is extraordinarily valuable. And I want to thank you for the commitment you bring to it every day. And for those of you who happen to not be staff members of the National Archives, you are sitting with the best and the brightest with what this preservation work can be done. So I hope you have an extraordinarily successful day. And uh, I'm glad I was able to speak to you before the rest of my voice is lost. So uh, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, my name is Mary Lynn Rissenthaler. I am the chief of the Conservation Lab. And I will be introducing our talks this morning. We have another fabulous series of talks this afternoon after lunch, so I hope that you will be able to listen to all of them. Our first speaker is Jana D'Ambrosio. She is a senior conservator here at the Archives. She joined um, the Conservation Lab in 2004. Jana um, happily and proudly comes from Youngstown, Ohio, and she became interested in fine art conservation while earning her undergraduate degree at the University of Pittsburgh. Jana earned her Master's of Arts and Certificate of Advanced Study in Art Conservation from the State University of New York, Buffalo State College, as well as a degree in fine hand bookbinding from the Canadian Bookbinders Book Artists Guild in Toronto. In 2000, Jana continued her study at the Vatican Secret Archives and conserved 14th to 17th century Italian archival records. She received a Booth Family Rome Prize from the American Academy in 2008, which permitted her to continue her research. At the National Archives, Jana has been studying the physical evidence found in late 18th century American bindings. Today, she will present some of her recent observations, and the title of her presentation is Historic Document Folding and Letter Locking Techniques. Jana? Good morning. I love working at the archives. And uh, I, it's a wonderful uh, holdings to work with because every day I get to handle uh, many or several of the 12 billion pages of records that are in our holdings <clears throat> that we are preserving for access. <clears throat> uh, today I'm going to talk about the teeny tiny folds, stabs, tears, drips of wax, burn marks. I'm going to talk about all these little tiny things that are on documents or are used to fold and seal and lock a letter shut so that this piece of paper then becomes its own envelope. And I'm going to talk about why that's important and how these little tiny physical details on our well-preserved documents here at NARA can help us um, contribute to the history in addition to the content of these documents. So it's a common sense and a very practical thing for us to do to want to take something and have it continue to um, uh, have it continue to uh, stay with its like subject matter. And that is the case here for the first printed copy of the Declaration of Independence, which is inserted in real time in the Continental Congress Journal. Uh, volume 3. And this perhaps was done by Charles Thompson, who's pictured above here uh, in this slide, uh, who is the Secretary of the Continental Congress. And uh, Norval Jones, who was one of our first trained conservators here at the National Archives, was charged in the 80s with removing that uh, Dunlap broadside from the volume. And, and it is now stored with this volume 
in the same box but stored flat. And so by studying this well-preserved document that is on our desks um, and studying those folds, we can see how it once functioned. And that's the value of making these models um, to understand and to show how um, the records uh, worked. Here is another uh, document that was folded and has sort of authentication marks. This document, these two documents recently came into the lab and were treated by Yunju Strumfels and Susan Page uh, for exhibit. So you can now go up into the, I think it's on exhibit. It's not on exhibit. Okay, well, uh, anyways, it's being prepared for exhibit for access. And uh, we had a moment to look at the, this record. It had been prepared in the past, but because there are some fold marks, we can, and stains from wax, which is the wax um, no longer exists, but the wax here and here, the stains, al along with these um, marks here, show us that perhaps the check was attached to the warrant. And this, of course, is the purchase of Alaska for $7.2 million. Um, and uh, so these little tiny details are telling us a little bit about the history. And then just by doing a quick web search on our own very uh, website for the blog of the archives, we can see a different warrant for the Treasury warrant to meet the House of Representatives expenses. And we can see a similar variation of that crisscross um, cancellation mark or something, but it's physical evidence and we want to make sure as conservators that we're paying attention to these details so we can preserve them for our colleagues, our scholars, and archivists who can help us identify them and relate them to the content. So now I'm going to jump over to documents that are handwritten as letters on paper. We think that this um, folding it up and locking it shut emerges from parchment document locking. Um, this is an example uh, from the 1500s, the earliest example we've seen so far is on paper is 1494, and, the, and what scholars are doing now is they're trying to look at the content and see these variations of folding to uh, take your handwritten letter, fold it up, seal it with wax, use paper to lock it shut, which is what you're sort of seeing uh, right here, what this, this man is doing right here, this businessman. Um, to send it, and at that time it was hand sent, so you gave it to deliver. And it, I mean, the topic's huge, so this is just a quick introductory, a teaser. And so um, this tradition of locking the letter shut uh, may have, in addition to just being a practical thing, it can also be like a um, to protect the contents inside an anti-tamper device. And maybe these traditions linger down to us into our own holdings from these. Um, heads of state. These, these three heads of state, their letters are in our archives here at the archives. And, um, but their letters that, that are in our collections now are more of a ceremonial record. Um, and uh, I've chosen this Bay of Tunis letter to show all the different points I want to point out from all of the million examples I couldn't show you to. Well, not million, but I haven't seen that many yet. But um, what we're looking at here is this letter written by probably a secretary. And another thing to point out is that I think that we think that the, this physical action of folding and locking may contribute to the content because the different heads of states, their letters are written in different and folded and locked in different formats. So it would be interesting to see if is it just an arbitrary thing that their secretaries or letter preparers are doing, or, or does the content contribute to what format it's delivered? Um, so this letter of state, uh, thanks to a colleague named Jig Benson, says that um, the Bay of Tunis has met Anderson and is telling the President of the United States, I've, I've seen his credentials and thank you very much. I think he's a diplomat there. We've sent this letter and pictures over to the Embassy of Tunisia to see what they can tell us. The content is um, Ottoman Turk. Uh, it's written in Ottoman Turkish language but in Arabic script. And the paper was folded in half and folded in half again to create margin lines, which is a tradition we see way back in the 1400s. Um, and it is when scribing a line to create your margins isn't the most exclusive way to do that anymore. And so um, this letter is folded and half written and then folded down to close it shut and then folded, as you've seen in the video, to um, create uh, 
to lock it shut, and then it's stabbed. And what's interesting is um, we are trying to figure out how it was folded, and we can do that because uh, by making a model, we see these burn marks. And there's one hidden underneath the paper locking device that the GPO binder just tapped, tagged, like pasted this, this locking device, which was detached and separate and functioned as a, lock, a locking device um, earlier in its existence. But these burn marks line up exactly where the wax would have been dripped on the paper. And the only wax, that, and, and it's in this bottom corner that you see here, when, the, when a model is folded up, all of these burn marks that repeat line up in this corner. And um, the only wax that's anywhere on this document is uh, right here, which thanks to Tish Curry, she pointed that out in this really interesting like triangle fold shape. And so we deduce that perhaps this is how, uh, in the lower left right corner, here, lower left corner, that maybe that's how the document arrived to us. So it would be really great to, for maybe archivists or scholars who are interested to see um, if this tradition maybe continues, and if there are other examples out there. This is the only one in our records. And um, what you're seeing also in the video is that there's so many folds in this document. And those folds tell us about what has happened to this record um, since it was opened up and read by the receiver. It was then folded down to a tri what's referred to as trifold, so that it can be filed. It was folded and labeled for filing. And then at a certain point in the in its history, it was decided, let's put it in a book with like subject matter so that um, we can look at all the letters from heads of state that announce the deaths of sultans and the births of princesses. And so the GPO binder uh, looks at this document. It's oversized. Your model you received is not the same size. Um, and it's cut in the top corner um, and folded in and then folded down, and you can see it in the small picture there. And that is sort of telling us <clears throat> that there are three separate um, instances where there are these cuts, folds, and stabs, and they all are different, and they all contribute to telling the story of this document, in addition to the content. Um, <clears throat> and again, all of these records have come across my desk and my colleagues' desk for exhibit or for digitization or for planning priorities or researcher needs. They're being, coming across our desk for access. And we have um, the privilege to snap a photograph and then start to keep a file and kind of connecting all the dots. And this book came in the lab for treatment for an ARC digitization project so that images can be matched up in our ARC digital data in our database. And I just happen to be repairing this page, and I don't, you know, book binders and conservators don't read books. We just fix them. And um, <clears throat> I see the words silk thread, sealed, corners, materials, you know, and, and of course my eye catches it, and I'm thrilled, and I snap a picture, because what this document is telling us is that maybe there are records that exist in our, in our holdings that were locked and folded shut to protect the contents, because this is a very common practice in the 15th, 16th century, to send a letter about your letter that says, I've locked this shut. This is how I've locked it. This is who delivered it. This is how you should receive it. So this is happening here in the USA. And um, it's exciting. Here is a letter written and made in the USA. And it is part of our Marshall's return of enemy aliens and prisoners of war. And this is a more typical letter. Um, it's often called, it's a variation of what's called a tuck and fold. You've been given an example of this and also the Bay of Tunisia. So please open your letters. That's very important. Two points, you can't open it without breaking the seal. You have to break the seal. You're going to have to tear it. And um, there's no right way to do it. But one of the great things to making a model is that you can see how the damage can occur or see how the artifact becomes what it is. The tears emerge. And you can start to make decisions about what um, can be repaired or how to keep things so that somebody can study them. And what we're seeing on this document here is that it's really hard to open this, this tuck and fold letter. And um, uh, part of the text gets torn away and stays with the wafer. So, Back in the day, of course, they don't have this electron, this um, glue gun, wax gun. They have wafers, which would have been pre-bought in a 
stationer shop moistened and just stuck underneath, and then that is your adhesive. And so um, by making a model, I can repeat this damage. And also, you'll see we're not going to, um, what just happened? We're not going to <clears throat> repair this damage here because that's part of the history of the artifact. That's created when the letter was opened. And so my message is that all of these physical details on our well-preserved records help us identify how things, how our records, what formats they were in before, during, and after they were in our, in our holdings. And all of these little tiny details can tell us something. And they, the, basically, the, these documents, these artifacts are our witnesses, and if we take away their little tiny nuances, then they as witnesses lose their voice. So I'd like to thank my colleagues and um, my uh, peers for helping me with this project, and especially my expert letter locker, Patrick, my nephew, who helps seal many of your letters. Thank you, Jana. That was pretty fun. Um, we have time for questions from people here in the room, um, and Dina Herbert is going to be helping with any questions that come in from the webcast. So. Do you need to do something to, okay. Any questions from um, the audience? So the question is, is how are the wafers made? Are they made, do they have a warp and a weft and are they made with textile? I don't think that they're made with textile, but they may be pressed between textile, which is leaving the impression of warp and weft on the wafer itself. The wafer is made out of, um, it can be starch paste, pigment like cinna cinnabar. Um, it can have little little bits of other things, like very teen teeny tiny amounts of wax, but it's created pre-made, and then you can buy them in a, or they were sold in a canister. Mary Lynn Ritzenthaler has a fantastic example, historic. Um, and then you, you would buy it at your station or shop, or like our CVS today, and you would, um, uh, use that as your adhesive. And, and that's also, which I didn't point out, used on the, the Dunlap broadside originally to attach it into the book. There are four wafers that were moistened quickly, and then the pressure and the moisture helped that adhesion action happen. One of the most famous ones that my supervisors worked on is the Declaration, I mean, is the Constitution that's engrossed in the, the Charter's cases. There's five pages, four on display, and they have six slits at the top. And Kitty and Marilyn tell me that there's blue thread remnants that were with that document. So those were once a bound records. The Constitution was once a bound record. This is a f famous one. That's a very good question. I think um, it depends on, on the binding structure and what time period it comes from. I've seen letters tucked and folded around book sections because there's no adhesive. Um, I think p they can just be simply folded up and stuck in the book. I think if any pages were attached with wafers, just one page and one was left, or if it was a sewn fascicle, eventually, if depending on how much wear and use it, it had, you would eventually have tears. So it would all just de depend on all of the physical nature of the materials. But I, I think people, it's human nature, just want to keep things together so that they're, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Thank you. Thank you, Jana.